I heard stories that coyotes uh, were around. I heard a few bites uh, had happened before that attack, but never fatal. There was evidence on the ground when I came on scene as well. I've seen a set of keys, a flashlight, a pocket knife, glasses, gloves, and there was struggle on the ground that I could see that the gravel has been moved and then there was blood and then where uh, Taylor's Mitchell body was, uh, you could see, uh, you could see the struggle. There's another frightening story we're following tonight. A young Toronto woman, an up and coming musician has been killed in a rare coyote attack. Taylor Mitchell had been hiking alone. She was on a popular trail in Cape Breton Highland National Park. The 19 year old victim was attacked near the trailhead. She was badly mauled by at least two coyotes and suffered serious blood loss. Mitchell was rushed to hospital in Shetakamp and then airlifted to Halifax in critical condition where she later died. At first, I did not believe it. When I got the details about what happened, I remember thinking, okay, this is very strange. All the scientists agree. Coyotes don't kill people, but that one exception. So trying to figure out what happened in that case, is it the coyote, is it the human? I mean, there's all kinds of theories that you can actually test here that may actually explain a lot about coyote behavior. This doesn't happen. It's not something that coyotes do. Uh, and, and for that reason, we have to understand the motivations of those coyotes, why they did what they did at the time that they did it, so it doesn't happen again. The doorbell rang, and then they came in and they said, do you know somebody named Taylor Mitchell? And my heart just sank, and I said, yeah, that's my daughter. And they said, well, there's been an accident. And of course I thought it was a car. I spoke to the doctor in Shetty Camp and um, that's when I, I learned it was quite serious. I was just praying to her the whole time I was talking to her in my head. You know, you and I can deal with this. We've dealt with everything else. We can deal with this. Just hang on. And all of a sudden, I just, my body started to relax and it started from the tip of my head and it just very slowly my body relaxed in a way that it's never relaxed before or since. And I very clearly heard her in my ear say, I'm okay now, Mom. And I, I say my soul very matter-of-factly said, she just died. Simone Gabois is an animal behaviorist with Dalhousie University. And sir, how do you explain what happened here? I really can't, because it's so uncharacteristic, uh, unusual for coyotes to do this. And I wouldn't be surprised if it started as just curiosity. And then if the person panicked, uh, then that tends to trigger, if you run away, for instance, it tends to trigger the predatory response. And that may have been the beginning of the end, basically. Nobody will ever know the truth. She's not here today to see what happened. Maybe she didn't know, she thought maybe she could feed them. Maybe they ate what food they, she had. They ate it and then they wanted more. And I believe maybe that's why they turned on her. Maybe she was just walking around and these coyotes just attacked her. Who knows? 
maybe some type that who knows, maybe she had some type of cologne on her, something, some smell, odor that she had, or something she had with her carrying that drove them coyotes in. Nobody will ever know. If nothing is done, it's going to happen again. I haven't lost any livestock to coyotes for a while. About two weeks ago, I walked out and counted my sheep, and before I knew it, there were four gone. So in the last couple of weeks, I've lost four sheep again. I've got a lot of calves that are in range of coyote territory, so I want to crack a rifle at them occasionally. And uh, the coyotes soon learn that even though it looks like a really great place to come and have a feast, that it's not safe for them. It was the accepted notion that coyotes never tended to bother people at all. And, uh, and now, after that happened, one, one has to realize that, yeah, especially small kids, if there's an opportunity for coyotes to, to do something, and if they just happen to be brave to that kind of an opportunity, then uh, one, one should be careful, I think. It's a parent's worst nightmare to think about a coyote being out there with your children. It's like everything's different now. October 31st. 1994. 1994, yes. How's that? Okay. <laughs> we were very, very close. You know, as she got older, it was just the two of us, and we hung around together. We were best friends. I was born beneath a smoky light. You couldn't face me if you tried. I got a broken father and a head full of gold Lost my mother to paper war Lost my mother to paper war She realized she could make a living at writing her songs and singing them. It all came together and she did her CD and yeah, the sky was the limit for her. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 18. You're 18 years old and you're writing deep stuff like that? It's just what I do. <laughs> she was going on tour, and a lot of musicians, when they go on tour, they just sort of go from venue to venue, and Taylor instead wanted to experience the places she was going to, and she was bound and determined she was going on the Cabot Trail. And she was writing songs along the way, because we found them in her songbook. I didn't really want her going hiking by herself. And she assured me that she would talk to people, you know, because I was worried about moose and bear. The coyotes never entered the picture. You know, I think a lot of people didn't really think about coyotes before this. As a professional working for Nova Scotia Natural Resources, I've actually seen firsthand what coyotes do or a pack of coyotes can do. Everything good? It's that way over there in the far field. I've been telling the people for the last 15, 20 years that, uh, you know, one day someone's going to get themselves either killed or badly mauled by a coyote. And to me, it was an inevitability. I've seen what they can do to a deer. You know, they can take a 200-pound healthy buck and make short work of them. 
And a 200 pound person is no more of a challenge than a 200 pound deer. They're extremely intelligent, smarter than any dog you will ever encounter. Strength ratio, a 50 pound coyote is stronger than most 100 pound dogs. They're just an incredibly powerful animal. I've hit them with rounds that should floor a moose and have those things still run off. I've had people complain that we've used bigger calibers on them and the concern was that we might be putting too big a hole in the fur. And some of those folks don't really understand that down here I'm not in the fur gathering business, I'm in the coyote killing business. Because uh, in my personal opinion, the only good coyote is a dead coyote. is a new animal to Nova Scotia. We never had them here. Not that I can remember, or my father or grandparents ever told me they seen a coyote. Because when my first coyote I got, I think it was in 87. And I had an old fellow up the road, he passed away a few years ago, he was 94 years old. And I put him in a coyote, he wanted me to take him over to see it. He had never seen that in his life, never heard of it. Ten, twelve years ago, you walk into the woods, down a trail in the spring of the year, you'd know a squirrel chirping, you'd see rabbits running in front of you, partridge drumming, birds singing. Most of the woods you walk in today, it's dead, because the coyotes have everything cleaned out. As a trapper, all we're trying to say is put the fear in these animals to send them, send them back in the woods. In other words, to show them who's boss. It's done a long migration east, basically, replacing the wolf in this geographical range. Most of the coyotes around here have some uh, wolf uh, gene contribution but very low. And again, that's something that happened, you know, 30, 40 years ago, way before they got here. So maybe what I'll do, I'll be at the bottom. Karina, if you want to stay right on the side of the road with him, short leash kind of thing, and if, if he indicates something, just let me know. Coyotes are actually generalists. They are like rats, pigeons, humans. They adapt to any kind of environment. Uh, they adapt quickly to changes in their environment as well. So, uh, yeah, they're here to stay, basically, and we'll have to make it work. Coyotes are an invasive species. People say, oh, well, we're invading their territory. That's such an incorrect statement. That just means you really don't have the knowledge about what you're talking about. Can you see those targets from there, Ken? Yes, sir. I went to war with the coyotes back in the early 80s when I was down in Cape Breton, and I was uh, an avid trapper since the time I've been 12 years old. And I can remember going into a trap set one day, and all I found left was the paw of a bobcat. And what had happened is two coyotes had come across him in the lake hole trap and, and killed him and ate him. And I just went, okay, you are now public enemy number one to me because now you're taking my livelihood on me. Take your time and surprise yourself with that shot. Just pretend it's one of those coyotes you shot from a couple hundred yards, bud. Get a good grip on that puppy. That one was a bullseye of the green. I was uh, basically a hunting fishing fanatic. It was passed down from my grandfather, my great grandfather, my grand uncles. And I realized that the number one way for me to build memories with my kids was to include them in all these things I was doing. And it gave me the chance to spend quality time with them. I knew that when they grew older, they'd look back and that'd be some of the best memories they had of things with their dad. That was sick. Where'd that one go, bud? A coyote hunt is something that's very hard. You gotta be pretty skilled because like, you know, we can shoot them from, you know, over 300 yards away. 
but... You can kick some serious ass, can I can kick some serious ass, yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> The popular attitude amongst farmers and in the general public is that uh, the coyote is uh, a much better animal when it's dead. And that's unfortunate. First time I ever saw coyotes ever in my life was right out this here window right here in that far field over yonder. My mom and my dad were here in the kitchen and my dad said, what are those things? And uh, shortly followed by, get me my 308. Those things are big enough they could carry off a kid. For me, I had a fondness for wolves, like a lot of people do. So to me, that was as close as I could get to uh, wolves in my backyard, uh, as I figured I was ever going to get. So to me, the, the notion of killing the coyotes to my idealist 15-year-old mind was uh, the antithesis of everything that was right in the world. Look at the past his chest. Do that again. Look at it. See it go by? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm pretty slower, maybe. That's awesome. Better. Let's see. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Look at this. In here. Right there you go. Right at us. Oh, yeah. Just, you I mean, over top of missed his chest. It went right, right by his chest. One of the things that we do is I have owned a production company. And one, one of the things that the production company does is produce a series called Festival Run. And it's a family owned business. And we've captured some things on film that uh, it's been pr some pretty remarkable adventures we've been on the last couple of years. There's probably like six of them. Six, I think. Yeah. They're all coming this way. One of the things I find the most exciting is when you get a half a dozen coyotes coming at you across a field, and we've been able to capture that. And then you switch from being the hunter to being the hunted. Sit tight. What always amazes me when we go back and we review the footage is how much these things act and look like wolves versus coyotes. Now they have a longer pointier face, but they've got a stockier frame body, they're big. It's not uncommon to get 50 pound, 50 pound coyotes out here in uh, Eastern Canada. And I actually, in my capacity at working for natural resources as a wildlife technician, I weighed a coyote back in the late 80s when they first went to Cape Breton and they decimated the, the uh, sheep industry in Cape Breton. I actually weighed a large male that, on official government scales, weighed 72 pounds. What seems to be happening with the size and the aggressiveness and the packing instincts of these coyotes is they're taking on the best of coyotes and the best of wolves and becoming this new Eastern Canadian super species. You know, if you look at the history of the wolf in Europe, uh, or even here in North America, we're replicating all of this again. It's the same kind of stuff, you know, that's developing. The 200-pound coyote in Cape Breton. <laughs> it's, it's, there's nothing more ridiculous than that. Good girls, yeah. Most of the ones I see are still around the expected 35 pounds. Maybe the largest one we've seen may have been 45 pounds. But, you know, that's human imagination and our perceptions are getting influenced by our fear.
I've been an outdoorsman all my life. I've hunted and trapped all my life. And you will learn one heck of a pile by being in the woods. You learn things that biologists and well-educated people, I can tell them things that they never even heard of, that I've seen in the woods. When you're getting them 60, 70, and up to 80 pounds, there's, it's not a coyote. They don't, they don't hunt like regular coyotes. They, where the regular coyotes usually hunt one or two, these hunting packs. They, uh, they act like wolves. They travel like wolves. And it was tested. DNA was taken out in the coyote from Nova Scotia. And they have the same DNA as the wolf from Northern Ontario. So they're part wolf. And it'd be like a, a hybrid type of coyote or a wolf, whatever. But whatever it is, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, it's dangerous. Weighed 74 pounds. Now get an animal like that and a person in the woods, walking in the woods, that come from behind and attacks you, you don't have too much of a chance. Right now in Nova Scotia, living in fear of coyotes. I mean, it's pretty sad and you can't go for a walk. The government considers a bounty to stop the attacks. Good evening, everyone. The province said it wouldn't happen, but after three separate coyote attacks this week, a bounty is now back on the table. The attacks happened all over the province, on Digby Neck on Tuesday, and yesterday in Goldenville, Guysborough County, and in South Maitland. It has Nova Scotians nervous and politicians reconsidering how to handle a suddenly aggressive coyote population. I don't know whether I would go down the road of a bounty, but I'm, I'm actually thinking I better investigate it, uh, where at one, one, one point in time I would have said, look, we're not going there. The attacks this week evoke memories of last October when 19-year-old Taylor Mitchell was killed by two coyotes. It put a, a fear in everybody. People that used to hike and walk, on, even on the main roads, everybody just quit. Every day, uh, there's people coming up to me and asking what can I do to protect myself? What can I do uh, to be safer? First thing you should do is not show fear and I know that can be difficult but essentially uh, stand your ground and uh, running away for instance would be a mistake. Pretty justified fear. You know. Just not much more than a hundred years ago, it was only wolves that ran through Nova Scotia. People persecuted them. They poisoned them, shot them, killed them every way they could. And the, the wolf had to, had to retreat. It's kind of a really crazy twist of irony that when the next dog comes back here to be a wild top predator in Nova Scotia, it's, it's got a whole bunch of wolf genes. So now it's like adapt and become a koi wolf. Wait, right at the top of his back, in about the center of him, and then come down about two inches. What's your uh, question? Uh, yes, I was in the Bedford area turning onto the Hammonds Plains Road one evening, just at the foot of the Hammonds Plains Road, and it was just shortly after 11 o'clock at night when I spot a coyote crossing the street. 
And I wasn't sure as to who I could or should call. I'll hang up while you give an answer. If you have any coyote concerns, you're supposed to contact your local natural resources office and they'll put you in touch uh, with either solutions to the problem or someone who can handle the problem. Just seeing coyote doing its own thing is not really a reason to call DNR, in my opinion. Um, I think you need to call only if you think there's a problem uh, that they're really too close to homes or whatever. But uh, one of the main hypotheses that we've developed from our work in, in Cape Breton is that um, if they, they lost their fear of humans fairly quickly within the last, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years, in principle, as quickly you can reverse this. So we're going to try, we're going to see, and we can talk in a few years and see if that worked or not. Simone Gedbois uh, with uh, Dalhousie University's Animal Behavior Research Center. Thank you so much. I mean, I spent a lot of my childhood in the woods of Quebec, eight hours in a row, and uh, eight years old. My mother wouldn't even know where I was, and I didn't see coyotes. Were they less dangerous back then than they are now? I don't think so. We're living a little bit with this coyote syndrome right now, and uh, basically what's going on is that we've replaced the wolf with a coyote. The wolf is the evil thing, etc. Um, and I think now the coyote is unfortunately getting that reputation as well, and uh, it's the, the new wolf, basically. We know that people feed uh, the coyotes in, in uh, the Cabrera Highlands National Park. And now they realize that a human is the source of food and the means to food. It's like you're a rat in the Skinner box pressing the lever to get a pellet. That's exactly what happens here. Actually change that, I'll start in a minute. And what you need to do basically is break that association that's been created. And that can be really, really hard. Did they sound to you like they were coming from down the valley or at, uh, on top? Down in the valley. Okay, that's what I thought too. Okay, look, I think we got it, so I'll just move to your location and then you can move on after, yes? Okay. We are literally walking into this, this new culture now that we think that, you know, if you go in the woods, it, it should be like having a, a walk in the park, and it's not. It never was. There's always a danger. constant uh, little rally that has to go on where humans can have an opportunity to stand up and say, coyotes, uh, we are humans and you should not trust us, ever.
we're gonna have to adapt just like this animal has adapted. That's one of the first things I thought when I heard about Taylor Mitchell. It's strange and it's new. And it's, uh, it's very, very, very real. I think there's still a part of me that's kind of like, did this really happen? It's really difficult to get to that point where you say, yes, I do need to move on and make a life for myself. I believe there was a message in, in what happened to her, and I think that that message is that we have to relearn how to coexist with wildlife. There should be a mutual respect between animals and humans. And I know that Taylor felt exactly the same way. She really had a love of, of wildlife. Instead of looking at them as these bloodthirsty animals that are sneaky or whatever, I have to, to figure out how I really feel deep down and I have to work on that. I want to see them as they really are, so I have to learn about them so that I can, I guess in a sense, forgive, forgive them. And since we started in August, I have to say that there's not much evidence for me that there is a, a current real problem or, you know, that it's widespread anyway. Right. And unfortunately, the media uh, tend to feed on speculation yes. and yeah. then we got into what I call this kind of coyote syndrome where you know people would uh, well did actually call uh, you know if they, they would see a coyote uh, right. half, a, half a kilometer away and well they had the media on the speed dial and uh, DNR and Parks Canada and you know it's 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 sad that we're um, at the point where we want to change coyote behavior when actually, I think, really, the solution is try to change human behavior. The CBC's Elizabeth Chu is live in our newsroom tonight with our top story. Elizabeth. Tom, three incidents in one week. DNR is taking some serious action now. It's called in the trapper to try to stop these aggressive coyotes in their tracks. There is some evidence that uh, leg hole traps will cause a behavioral change in the animals left in the population that will make them more wary of people. And in particular, I'm worried about children and I'm putting people ahead of coyotes in this regard. This neurobiologist studies coyote behavior. He told the minister the bounty could actually boost their numbers. Uh, it's science that says it doesn't work. In fact, science even suggests that it can get uh, worse uh, because if you clear the, the top of the food chain from the important predators, then the preys uh, are in the increase. This means basically that uh, um, there's more food available for the pups the next season. Uh, so the survival rate of the pups is higher. You know, the shame of it is, is I keep hearing scientists say, well, if you kill coyotes, they have larger litters. Well, to me, that's beyond uh, any level of, of intelligence. There's just no common sense to that statement. Dead coyotes don't have anything. You know, I can never see this enough. Wild E. Coyote. This guy's right here. Oh yeah, this is gonna be perfect. You know what's nice? How cold it was, look at this. It's the steam back. when you're breathing, right? Okay, so Drew, find that footage where Candace shoots that big one. All right. There's the clip I want. Coyote hunting for the longest time. These aren't the 25 pounders that are out west. This is, more, this is more like an eastern wolf. Yeah, this is an awesome clip right here. One less coyote in Nova Scotia. A lot of happy sheep, sheep farmers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, you know my policy. Oh, yes. I kill them all. The truth is I could go and shoot coyotes and shoot them and shoot them and shoot them. And every time one come into my field and I could get quite trigger happy and keep a tally about how many coyotes I got and versus how many lambs and calves they've got. But in the end, I'd just be 
doing it for time immemorial, I think. When a coyote comes and threatens the sheep flock, the llama will usually be the first one to notice it because they're really observant, and uh, the donkey will usually be the more aggressive one to chase it out, kicking and biting all the way. So this is my attempt to try to coexist with coyotes instead of just uh, shoot them all. <laughs> because of the bounty, people are not going to go out there and shoot every coyote that's in the country. It's just, it makes a sense because it, people won't go in the woods hunting them, but if one of them comes out in their backyard, the aggressive ones that are around houses, those are the ones that could be taken out, which would be a great thing. I feel really badly that there was a call called and they tried to use Taylor's name. And I was very upset about that because I knew that Taylor would be devastated about that. If you want to do it, if you feel that that's what you have to do, I don't agree with it, but don't use my daughter's name. It breaks my heart that, you know, that these people live in this beautiful, beautiful country and they're scared to go out their back door. I was in the woods recently at one point, and it was getting dark. And I remember at one point I heard some noises behind me. And I have to tell you that for the first time ever in my life, as a scientist, I actually stopped for a second and I thought, could this be a coyote or coyotes? I feel almost ashamed of thinking that way, but you know, the reality is when you hear a story like that, it strikes the imagination. Fear is this weird thing, it's really difficult to beat. This where he was chewing on a snare. Gradually, he would have he would have chewed his way out of it, because this is cable and this is the way he had it all tangled up. And that's what that's the name of the game. We want to take some of these out because th there's a house here. What maybe about what uh, 100 yards or so from here. In this direction, there's two more houses, which they were around. There's a family up here that has children four and six years old, and he told me himself he was scared to let the children outside because the coyotes are right outside around the house. So this is what we're this is what I'm here for. Take them out. Working on my second one now. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. That's all right. 
a lot of people don't realize what they are. So this is it. We have to try to get everybody to understand what this is about. There's too many. We can take the population down to the, to the right level, like any other animal. We're not going to have no problems with kites. I'm glad I got a few young people with me, helping me out to do this. There it is. Nose is right over. OK, good. I know there's a lot of people just can't take it because there's some, especially the coyotes, sure don't smell good. But we need somebody to do it. If you live in rural Nova Scotia or rural Atlantic Canada or rural anywhere where they have large eastern coyotes, it is incumbent on you to get a firearm and learn how to use it. And you're the ultimate person who can protect yourself from a coyote. And the bottom line is the policies currently that are in place are designed to protect you from aggressive coyotes. The problem being is there's no way to tell which one I'd said it before are the aggressive ones. The aggressive ones don't wear flashing neon signs that says, you know, there's six of us here, but I'm the aggressive one. So unfortunately for the coyotes, which are an invasive species, uh, the best solution for them, and I'll say it over and over again, dead coyotes don't cause problems for anybody. Live ones always do because they always get old, they become infirm. Well, if you're a coyote and you can't hunt like you used to, all of a sudden your diet will change. And my prediction is in Nova Scotia, one day on that diet will be a kid. Hey, Zila. Hey, Zila. Let's go. As a parent, I have to say it's, it's, um, it, it totally affects how you think about, you know, letting your, your kids go in the woods and, and spend time there without supervision or with supervision, whatever. But I will certainly teach them about safety in the woods, no doubt about it. Probably more so now than before. And it's not just coyotes, it's moose uh, during the breeding season, it's black bear. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, dangers out there if you really want to focus on the dangers. You have more chances to be killed or injured by your own dog. I think it's not a coincidence that a lot of the incidents have happened in, in suburbia, where I think there, there is a bit of an attitude there where, you know, I have a home, I have a backyard, shouldn't see wildlife in that backyard. Oh, maybe the cute red squirrel, but, you know, and the chickadees, but, you know, anything more than that, no, please. And I think, unfortunately, that's a cultural thing. That, that's a thing that we need to change. You know, if, if you don't live downtown, you go in suburbia or in the country, deal with it. I mean, there is some wildlife, and they're doing their best to survive. Sheep, sheep, sheep! So say you're a sheep farmer too, and you're just like a young kid sheep farmer down playing with the sheep, and like, and then I come along as a coyote. Okay. Okay? And like, you're just looking at the sheep, and you don't even see me down here like this. And you're just like looking at your sheep. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> you're just looking at your sheep. Look at your sheep. And then... <laughs> Can I do another one? Yep, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, That's good. My brain won't really let me go to the attack because I realize that the attack itself is not something I need to be concerned with because it happened and she died from her injuries. And that's cold, hard truth and I need to move forward and I know that Taylor would want me to do that.
I came here so that I could go up to the Skyline Trail and be there on the, the second anniversary of Taylor's passing. With the RCMP, Constable Ron Prey, who was one of the very first on the, the scene, and I met him before. There was a real connection with him. Funny how the emotion starts to come back, you yeah. know? When you're on site. Yeah. I can remember everything. Yeah. It seems that it's been yesterday. It's weird. I know it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. There's not a day I, I don't think about it. Yeah. yeah. So? Well, hopefully one day we'll, we'll all get to the point where we don't think about it every day. The day after it happened, I talked to Constable Ron Prey, and, and he was devastated. I was trying to talk to him and I was saying, you know, have you seen the pictures of her on TV? You need to look at those pictures, this vibrant, beautiful girl who was living every moment of her life. So oh yeah? A little bit over there. So. I came back to Toronto and he called me and he had been debriefed by then and he was sounding much better and now he was trying to help me. He was asking me how I was doing and it was really amazing the way it worked, that I was able to help him and then he was able to help me. We both felt that Taylor was there and just to know that her spirit is very much there, but it's peaceful. And that was really nice. 